Our scripture today is Mark chapter 1, verses 29 through 39. As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sunset, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed by demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let us go on to the neighboring towns, so that, so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout all Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. My friends, it's a delight to be with you and worship this very Sunday morning. This past weekend, I was invited to Candler Seminary to participate with ministers from across the country in um, some, uh, some sessions together discussing the state of the church as well as ways that seminaries could assist local congregations. And at the end, they decided to introduce a third year MDiv student to speak to us, to give final reflection over the uh, proceedings of the days before. And she did a spoken word poem. She said this line repeatedly in a spoken word poem that lasted 20 minutes long. She said, how am I supposed to sing when I can't even breathe? Pretty provocative statement. George Floyd came to mind. Social issues in our culture came to mind. Her beauty in storytelling through a poem called all these different social situations that we've experienced, that we've interpreted through our own interpretive lenses and, and morals and feelings and assumptions and prejudices. And, and the thing I got from it was this guttural human cry that no matter who you are, no matter what pain you're facing, you are a person in transition facing something. Your pain may not be the same pain as mine and we can compare them, but the bottom line is your pain is your pain. Your story is your story. And we are all going through this one world that is filled with pressures and challenges and difficulties. And so I thought at the end of it, how, how refreshing it was to be affirmed in my own personhood that there are times in this world and times in this culture and times all around where I don't feel like I can breathe. Depending on what you're facing, you may not feel like you can breathe. So if you cannot breathe, then how can you sing? And even call to the house of the Lord to sing today, to sing joys of songs of joy and songs of hope and songs of sorrow. So how can you sing if you cannot breathe? How can you hear from the Spirit of God if you cannot breathe? Which is why I begin every Sunday by asking you to breathe. So please, close your eyes and breathe at your own pace. But let each exhale or inhale be cleansing to your mind. Let it make room for the spirit. You're here for a reason. You're here for a reason that you don't even know yet. What does God want to say to you? What does God want to do with us? So just take a few moments to center yourself and let it all go. Let the worries go to hear from God. God wants you to breathe, friends. 
It's no mistake that in Hebrew, the same word for spirit is breath. When you come to your next hill, I want you to let all the air go slowly. Breathe in the breath of God. God, we are here together as your people from different stories and backgrounds, different races, different traditions, different worries, different concerns, different politics. But we are all brought together by the call of your son, Christ, our savior, who is your example of coming to be as us and for us. God, whether anyone else knows it or not, you and I know that without you, I can do nothing. We are all helpless without you. So we pray that your Holy Spirit fall freshly upon this place, that your spirit would be the very breath of our spiritual lives, the very breath in our lungs to animate us with new life, that we may go forth with breath and life to breathe into all the, the dusty places of the world, to all the, the dry places of the world, the places where justice and love need to shine once more. Help us, God. We pray these things in the matchless name of your Son, our Savior Christ, and everyone says in his name together, amen. On Wednesday night, I woke up from a rather strange dream, and I can't wait to tell you about it. I was in one of these kind of places. You know how dreams are, are a little weird. Things aren't, the lines between one thing and another thing don't make sense in dreams. Wherever I was, it was sort of a church space. We were supposed to give ourselves to the thoughts of the divine, have a divine encounter, just like church, but it looked a lot like a golf course. And I was there trying to, to play golf and worship Jesus. <clears throat> I'm a minister. I guess that's part of the job description. But the thing of it is, is I was paired up with Alice Cooper. <laughs> For those of you who don't know who Alice Cooper is, he was a 1970s rock and roll guy, kind of looked like a ghoul or a vampire, and he sang, School's out for summer. Do, 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 do. <laughs> Quite frankly, I didn't like his music. But the thing about Alice Cooper was, is he had this whole mystique about him that he was this ghoulish sort of guy. Now, here's the thing that a lot of people don't know about Alice Cooper. One, he's a scratch golfer, which means he's really good if you don't know golf. I am not a scratch golfer. You would not think a vampire to be a great golfer, but indeed, Alice Cooper is. And what's more surprising is that he's a born-again evangelical Christian. Again, for those of you who knew Alice Cooper in the 70s, you would not have thought that about him, but he is, in fact, a Christian. Now, he's interesting. He's intelligent. He's witty. He had a radio program when my wife and I first married that she, she used to listen to with her father because Alice Cooper is entertaining. And, and as I was out on this churchly golf course with Alice Cooper. He had all the, the ghoulie uh, face paint on, but he was wearing golf clothes. So it was totally just this weird cognitive dissonance. And he's telling me about how to hit a better golf shot and how to follow Jesus better. And I would come up, across, up, up amongst someone else on another tee box who was a Catholic priest. He was a young man. He must have been like 19 or 20. And he, and he had a golf polo that somehow had a clerical collar. I got to get one of those. And, and he, he pulled me aside and he goes, why are you with this guy? Look at him. He looks like a ghoul. And so now I am a little put off and I'm trying to explain about to this young Catholic priest who's worried for my salvation. I have to explain to him why I'm with Alice Cooper and who Alice Cooper really is. And that Alice Cooper really cares about my relationship with Jesus. A few more uh, holes down the way. I I'm no longer with that Catholic priest. I'm still with Alex Cooper. He, he goes off to get us a hot dog. And, and I'm now with a bunch of rock and roll guys. And they're not wearing the face makeup like Alex Cooper, but they look like tough rock and roll guys. Like they look dangerous and they want to know why I'm spending my time with this guy who plays this wimpy game called golf and listening to him talk about Jesus. And I'm now trying to convince them that he's got street cred. You guys don't know Alice Cooper. He scared people in the seventies with his rock and roll. And I went on and on and on. And if you're astute to dreams and mental health, you might recognize what I was having was a rather fanciful anxiety dream. Because in that dream, it was fanciful like dreams are. I was actually having anxiety play out by expressing myself or explaining myself over and over to each group. Why? To justify myself. Why would I be friends with this fellow? And why did I want to be around him? Who do you prefer to keep company with? 
and why? What is it that makes you prefer somebody over somebody else or one type of person over someone else? Is it social expectation? In my dream, it was a lot of social expectation put in front of me. You know, we all are inheritors of a world. I don't think many of us lived in this world, but many of us are inheritors of the world where uh, social expectation in your relationships was really important. There was a day and time where there was the Irish neighborhood and there's the Italian neighborhood and the Jewish neighborhood and the black neighborhood and on and on and on. And in these neighborhoods, you, you weren't really supposed to mix very much. I don't think many of us grew up in that, but we, we've inherited it. And, and, and lines are erased with generations and lines are redrawn. Social expectation. Who is it that you're expected to spend time with? Maybe that's what fuels who you prefer to be with. Maybe, though, it's just the simple American God, one of the American gods that, that drives your feelings about who you want to spend time with. And, and that God is comfort. I, I think that's a little more simple of an explanation, don't you? I want to be with people who I can feel comfortable around. Now, they may be different than me. They may have different interests than me. They may have a different background. But as long as there's something about them that makes me feel comfortable, and the opposite's important, too, that they don't make me uncomfortable, they don't make me uncomfortable, well... Maybe I'd prefer their company. I don't know. The thing of it is, as I ask myself that question a lot this week, who do I prefer and why? And what does it say about me? I ask myself another question. What's the heart of God? Because I do, sincerely, as I stand here before you, I, I want to know the heart of God because as best I can as a human being, I want to live into the heart of God. I want God's heart to be like my heart. I, I want to be good with God. And so how do I know what the heart of God is? I think it's as simple as following Jesus in the stories of the Bible. When we see what Jesus is up to, we are seeing God's heart for the world. And when we follow Jesus today, we find out something about who God prefers. In our story this morning, Jesus preferred to be around sick people. Do you like being around sick people? I know we all just came out of a societal insanity called COVID. So let's kind of put that off to the side for a moment. We were all over the map on that. But in general, do you, do you enjoy or prefer or seek out the company of the sick? When we do, we, we threaten ourselves with some annoyance with getting sick ourselves. Now, I got to tell you, after I had gone through my liver transplant surgery, I, I now have kind of a, a heightened awareness of people's health. And I'm just being confessional to you. I, I don't get excited about being around sick people. And in fact, it, it scares me. And, and I have these experiences where I'm around people and I just, I'm heightened. I'm, I'm more attuned in the senses to their sniffles and their coughs. Oh, and I hate it when people say, it's just allergies. I was, well, did the doctor tell you that? Or are you just diagnosing yourself, MacGyver? <laughs> I'd love to tell you that I'm, I'm like as great a human being as, as Sister Teresa, but I, I come around church or social settings and I tell people lies like, oh, I'm, I'm fine, I'm not worried, it's okay. No, inside I'm like, please don't let me get sick. I, I can't do that, it's really bad. Doctors are warning me, don't get sick. And, and so I, I have experienced this one occasion where I'm standing there talking to somebody and I can hear they got that little grovel in their throat and I can hear just a little bit of, of stuffiness in the nose and I'm thinking to myself, oh, okay, well, they must be sick. Just do your best, Jared, do, do your best. Keep looking at them in the eye, listen to them, nod. You have to tell yourself that when you have to remain focused because all I'm hearing is that gravelly voice. And that, and that seems like, is, is, there decon, is there congestion getting worse? I just, you know, I'm going to smile. I'm just going to take a step back. Oh, they stepped closer. Oh, good. That's great. And then I saw the dreaded thing. You ever see this before? You're talking to somebody and there's just a, a flicker of light like a diamond in the grass, but it's just under their nose. I see it. I'm fixated on it. I can't help it, brother. I'm a little crazy. 
It's mucus. I know, I know, I don't need to say that word in church. It is, though. It, it's there. I can see, oh, is it getting bigger? And then the thing is, is I can, as they move their hand like this, it's like I'm in a, a movie and it's slow motion and, I, and my spirit is going, no, as they do one of those. They got it. They touched it. And then there's a shaking of the hand. And then I shake the hand. I smile. And then I just kind of do one of these until I can get to the thing. Do you prefer the company of those who are sick? Jesus did. It's not just an annoyance for Jesus or in Jesus's day. It's not risking a cold. Jesus didn't walk around with a bravado that says, I am not afraid of a virus or I'm strong and healthy. He didn't walk around like that. Je Jesus was doing more by risking himself to viruses. He was spending time with people who were marginalized because the sick in Jesus's day weren't just sick. They were on the social and spiritual margins of society. They weren't included deeply into the religious life of the people. They weren't included deeply into the communal flow of the people. They were on the edges of everything. He is encountering people in the story who have viruses and bacterial infection. Some have mental health disorders. Some probably have issues that they can't see with the eyes, but you can see the symptoms only. Some people are so spiritually sick, they're possessed by demons. And Jesus is seeking these people out as he is in this window to my left. This is the works of mercy window where people are coming to surround Jesus with their ailments and illnesses and with compassion and mercy, Jesus touches them and heals them. And there's one way I like to understand this in the Bible. Whenever you see Jesus doing these miracles, you are revealing, seeing the revealed heart of God, sure, but what you, you can also read alongside of that is that this is life when God is in charge. This is what it looks like. When li life when God is in charge looks like a world where people who are broken are made whole again, where people who are disenfranchised are included again. And when those who are pushed out on the margins by others in society, they are brought back into the embrace and the warmth of communal life. Life is made right when God is in charge. And so Jesus seeks these people out, not simply because he feels badly for them, but because he has this radical desire to include people into his own love. That's the heart of God. He does this so much that in our passage, he's got to go away for a while, which when I read this, I'm reminded that ministry and service to other people, however you serve in your ministries, it can overwhelm and tire you out. And even Jesus, the Lord and Savior of our lives, he needed some Sabbath and time with the Father. So much so that he got away where the people have to go look for him. And when they go look for him, he turns his attention and says, let's go look for more who are sick. Today, as we begin this month, we think about how God prefers the company of the marginalized which is obvious. It's obvious if you read the scriptures, it's obvious if you read our windows, God keeps choosing the people that no one else chooses. It doesn't take long to read the pages of the gospel to find out that, that that's who God's, God's heart beats for. And so preachers and activists and writers and idealists that we are, the first thing we wanna to say to you we want to start shouting out injustices in society. We want to start talking about how we need cultural revol revolution because the, the, the reality is we have a world that's filled with systems of injustice. We're celebrating Black History Month now, and we all know that African Americans in our world started off on the starting blocks way back behind European Americans due to slavery and many, many generations of injustice. We can look at other people groups who have been marginalized. It could be racial and ethnic, or it even can be to do with sickness. Think about the 1980s fear of AIDS and how people were marginalized, pushed aside, ignored, uh, avoided. The comfort level wasn't high when we start talking about all these things. And so people like me, we, we apt to stand up here and talk about the revolution of the world that Jesus wants to bring through us. And, and, and it's important then for me to tell you about how you should vote because it really matters and, and where you spend your money because it really, really matters. It actually really matters more than you realize. It, it, it's an opportunity to us to start a public discourse and an argument over what is right morally and ethically and so on and so forth. But here's the thing of it, and I'm convinced of this too, 
I'm convinced of all that. It, what we vote, the way we vote matters, the way, we, the way we go about our world matters, the way we engage our neighbors matters, the way we think about laws matters. It all really, really matters to Christianity. But here's the thing. I can't tell you any of that because we are more polarized than ever. And we don't listen more than ever before. Social science is proving that we are getting involved in our own silos. So if I even try, if I even try, I risk alienating you. And what it tells me, what it tells me about my own self is before I can bring a revelation, a revolution to the world, I must have a revolution in my own heart. One of our conservative brothers who I enjoy reading from time to time is named David Brooks. He writes for the New York Times. He's got a new book out. I don't know if you know about David Brooks, but he's, he's had a spiritual awakening in the past middle, te middle teens of the 2000s. The most recent book he wrote was about growing in wisdom, right? He, he's hanging out with theologians and pastors now. He's changed his life completely from being a rather atheistic intellectual to now uh, seeing the intellectual la life of the church. And, and this new book, and I, and I don't have the notes here. I, I, I can't remember the title. It's his brand new book. It's basically how to be a human being, how to talk to people. I mean, he's written more books than I have. People know his name more than they know my name. So I don't care if you don't like him because he's conservative or, or if you don't like him because he writes for the New York Times. Or, he, he's, he's got some street cred. And he did a lot of research at very fancy places with a lot of fancy names to write a book about how to talk to people because that is where our world is. And in that book, he notes some very startling truths that you know if you don't know it, you know it in your bones. Suicide is at an all-time high in our society. All time. Loneliness is an epidemic, they say. Isolation, feelings of isolation on the rise. Loneliness is so high that sometimes I think the church ought to change mission statements. Like every church should be like this. Like, um, don't be lonely, come here. Like people are lonely. Maybe the church is to say, you don't want to be lonely, come join us. We can be lonely together. Suicide at an all-time high in our society. Now, this past week I was sitting at dinner and we had uh, my daughter and her friend from school. They were sitting there talking and my mom was asking my daughter's friend, last year, your mom homeschooled you for the year, right? She, she took her out of the school system for one year and she said, well, how'd that go? And my daughter's friend said, eh, that's boring. And then my daughter and her friend said, well, we wish we had phones so we could have kept up with each other. You know, this whole little, you know, we wish we had phones so we could have like kept each other company during that long and terrible year. She's 11. I don't want her to have a phone. And I try not to say that, but I try to say something a little bit more erudite, like, oh, kids, not the phone. Uh, I hope you don't have to go for some time without that handcuff of a phone. Because, you know, phones, you know, I used to think my phone would make my life better and easier. Has anybody found that it makes it better? You, you do? To me, it's like a weight around my spiritual neck. And so I try to communicate that to her. And then my daughter, who's very bright, says, well, she's been studying in social studies class, right? Well, Dad, now, now I, would, I, would, I would have a phone, but I would never get on any social media platform because uh, studies show that that is uh, helping cause the rise of suicide in our country. Now, there's a, a lot of questions to unpack about that, like the causal or correlative or what it adds to it. But the point is, is my daughter's 11. She's gotten the word that there's something that's not good out there that's affecting the mental health of kids. So David Brooks has said, Here's one thing that you can do. It's the most radical thing you could do in the world is actually pay attention to people. Look them in the eye. Last week, we talked of 
how Jesus th- shows the heart of God is compassion. I told you that calm means with and passion means pain. When we have compassion, we are entering into the pain of another human being. It isn't feeling bad or pity for another human being. It is to walk into their pain. And that is somehow the most human thing that you can do is to be in the pain of another person. It is in fact what God has done through Jesus Christ, entered into the pain of human existence and to transform it from the inside out. That is what we call salvation. God God has stepped into us. He didn't just move us like pieces on a chessboard. He became us to influence and transform us. The most radical thing you could do is to understand the narrative of another person, not to argue points of view, not to reject their experience, not to assume you get their experience, but to truly look them in the eye, see them as the concrete, irreplaceable mystery that you will never fully comprehend or understand or manage, and see them as this person in the image of God who has a story that's different than yours, and try to enter into that story. We live in a world right now where we can say people who wear MAGA hats, who don't like the wealthy, by the way, who think that uh, jobs are going away and so we ought to form populist movements, people who feel this way, we just may dismiss them or we may accept them. But here's the thing I ask everybody before you dismiss them, do you understand why they hurt? Do you understand why populations of people have completely changed the way they think and vote? Do you understand what's hurting them? And then we can at the same time hear somebody say something like Black Lives Matter, and you can want to recoil and say, well, what about the blue lives and the white lives and the yellow lives, and go on and on and try to be smart and try to be sophisticated. But do you understand why anyone would have to say that? Do you get the narrative of another person? Because if you don't, we're missing the chance of being human and to see someone else. David Brooks says quite astutely, that our ethical paradigms are shaped by Kant and John Stuart Mill. And so we've created these abstract ideas. They're all abstractions. And it's really interesting. I, I think this is funny. David Brooks says, of course, it is men who came up with these abstractive notions about how to treat people as humans. Men would do that. We would come up with concepts and abstract them. But he pointed to the author I read to you last week, Simone Weil, a woman philosopher, and her heir, Iris Murdoch, the playwright, poet, and philosopher, who, who said, you can come up with an ethics, not by abstraction, but by awareness. Of course, it would be women who would know how to be human more than men, because women get compassion. They get it intuitively. They know what it means to enter into, in the life of the womb, a pain that brings life. It's what compassion means. Friends, the revolution has to start here. Even in church, are you preferring the company of some? Do you avoid the others? Do you alienate and divide? Do you, do you create stories that make you afraid to touch each other? Or do you look at people and see them as a piece of divinity, that there's a little bit of God in their eyes when they look at you, to see the little bit of God in your eyes? If you want a divine experience today, look someone in the eyes unafraid, look at them with love, feel their pain and feel their joy. Look at them and see them and let them know they are seen. There's a lot that will teach you about being a human, and this is one of them. And all of you know that um, I went through a health experience this past two years. And when you almost die, you learn a lot of things. And when I came out, I learned that too much of my life was about achieving something. It was about outflanking problems, outmaneuvering problems, outthinking problems. It was about worried about too much what other people think. It was about fulfilling my dreams and hopefully fulfilling other people's dreams without letting them collect. What it was, was hurried and harried and unfocused. And when I came out, I read this book by Kosuke Koyama, a Japanese theologian, is called Three Mile an Hour God. And I love it because he reminds us that how God knows us is by becoming as us. The heart of God is revealed in Jesus. Jesus walks with us to save us. He gets us into our pain. And the average human being walks at three miles an hour. So our God is a three mile an hour God because God walks slowly with us. Kosuke says, 
We live today an efficient and speedy life. But let me make one observation. I find that God goes slowly in the educational process of man. Jesus Christ came. He walked towards a full stop. He lost his mobility. Full stop, he was nailed down. Just as God has condescended, there's something different about standing there and then coming to be with you because this is what humanity is. And this is what we're called to be. And my friends, you want to know the heart of God. I know you do. You want to know who God preferred. He preferred the marginalized and the broken. And God, that meant me. And God decided to see me and walk slowly enough to see you. Let's walk slowly enough to see each other. And if at the end of the day we become more human, God be it.